Just kind of introduce yourself a little bit. Tell, tell us about yourself and uh, why you decided to, to run for office. I grew up on a farm halfway between Central City and Fullerton on Highway 14. Went to a one-room country school about two miles from where I grew up. Went to the public school in Central City beginning in seventh grade through uh, twelfth grade when I graduated. Went to the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and uh, my degree was in actually uh, journalism, broadcast journalism, uh -huh. and I worked at a radio station part-time all throughout college and as a disc jockey and then also worked at KOLN TV part-time during college and then that worked into a full-time after college. My first year in college I walked on the football team, Tom Osborne's first year as, as head coach at Nebraska, and uh, then after that um, had various other jobs going through school, put myself through school. And uh, then, uh, regarding the political arena, my mom and dad were both involved in a lot of different community services. Uh, at, I think there were 10 different organizations, school board, hospital board, school, uh, church board, fair board, you know, all these different organizations. So service was just kind of part of our my growing up and watching, watching it with my mom and dad. When I went to the University of Nebraska then, I did work for the Secretary of State. He's the number three person in the executive branch, right. and I worked for him, Alan Behrman, all the way through school. And um, I drove for him and then did some work for him in the office. Also, my junior and senior year in college, I worked as a page in the legislature. So I do know where all the bathrooms are in the state capitol building. <laughs> That's important. That is important. <laughs> yep. After I graduated from college then, I did work at KOLN TV for a year, but then discovered that uh, the Air Force is hiring. So I took the test, got my commission through officer training school down in San Antonio, Texas. I did go to a pilot training at Vance Air Force Base, Enid, Oklahoma. Was selected to be an instructor pilot. Stayed on as an instructor pilot for three years at Vance. And then from there, I flew F-16s at Ramstein, Germany, and did that for about four years. After I had finished 10 years in active duty Air Force, then I got hired on by Delta Airlines, and I flew a full career at Delta. Oh, okay. And do you still do that, or what's, what's, how are you currently employed? I'm currently employed doing this full-time, <laughs> <laughs> campaigning. So far, I've knocked on about 5,000 doors in uh, the legislative district, District 34 that I'm in, represents Mary County, Central City, yep. Hamilton County, yep. Aurora, and Fullerton. Uh, that's Nance County. Those are the county seats. Yep. Of course, you have other towns in those counties. And then also a good portion of Hall County. Correct. Yeah. And I'm sure you know this, Steve, and most of the viewers know it, that each legislative district has about 40,000 constituents in the, uh, the district. In terms of legislative priorities, uh, I'm sure property taxes and tax structure is something that comes up when I talk to folks in your district quite a bit. Maybe tell me a little bit about that one, but then some of the other priorities that uh, you think that uh, the 49 folks in the body ought to be addressing. Well, as I said a moment ago, I've knocked on 5,000 doors and people certainly do have their opinions on what's important. Believe it or not, property taxes is not one of the things that's in the forefront of their minds. But what's going on in our schools is by far at the top of their minds. What they've seen in the news regarding sex education in schools and um, promoting CRT, critical race theory, 1619 Project, Black Lives Matter, people are irate with what's going on in education, and rightly so. Um, a lot of people know that uh, property taxes currently about two-thirds of your, your property taxes goes for your schools. So we're all supporting the government-run schools, and they're very, very upset about it. I noticed you used the term government-run schools. Why not call them public schools? Generally, schools have been viewed as a public good. Um, some people have said calling them government schools is a negative connotation and implies that um, this is some, some, some negative things. Correct. Well, first off, I just want to point out that I said I, my degree was in broadcast journalism, but I do have a teaching degree uh -huh. in speech. So oh, I am okay. a certified teacher. Sure. So uh, I do appreciate the public schools, as you said. And here in the heartland of Nebraska, we've got fantastic public schools. And so I do not want to demean them. But it, this is interesting. Regarding public education 
it costs approximately $1,000 a month, $12,000 a year per student. On the other hand, for uh, private schools, mm -hmm. and these are Nebraska figures, okay. it, for a private school, it's $3,700,000 per student per year. And if you homeschool your child, it's approximately $1,000 per year. So competition is a good thing. Um, in terms of, you mentioned critical race theory in particular, when I ask school administrators, and I've asked several in your district, they say that that's not included in their curriculum, that that's just a boogeyman argument, that we're trying mm -hmm. to scare people. Uh, what, what, what are your, what's your response there? That's why I love living here in Nebraska, and particularly this part of Nebraska, because what you just said is true regarding this area. Okay, but you think it's not true everywhere then? When a person goes and represents your area here in Nebraska goes to Lincoln, you're also representing Omaha right. and Lincoln. So not every place is as, want to avoid the word Pollyanna, but uh, you know, as, as lovely as an area as we have here in the middle of the state of uh -huh. Nebraska, it's fantastic. We've got good hardworking people, and for the most part, they keep their thumbs on what's happening in the education area. Um, in terms of just uh, the, the legislature and the makeup of it, uh, we are unique in that we are the only one house unicameral legislature. We are officially nonpartisan. It is a unique body. And, and your thoughts on that, uh, that history and uh, there's been, been some talk about maybe we need to change that. Or do you like that? Or what, what do you like about it? I, I don't know. What are your thoughts on, on Nebraska's unique uh, legislature? Well, I think that overall people need to be involved in what you say is, is true. It is nonpartisan. Uh, now, each legislator do identify with one party or the other. Now, there are a few that consider themselves independents. But um, for the most part, it is uh, nonpartisan. And there is some value in looking at other options like th what the other states have. So we need to hear the arguments on both sides of that. But overall, we need to be involved in our political process. I just read an interesting statistic uh, recently, and this is a, a nationally. But of all people that are able to register to vote, only 65% of those people actually do register to vote. So one third are not even registered to vote. And out of the two thirds that are registered to vote during presidential years, only 59% of those people vote. So that's almost half of the two thirds of our population. And during non-presidential years, which what we are having, coming up here in the year 2022, <clears throat> then only 39% of those registered to vote vote. So actually one third of the two thirds vote. Not good. And then when you go down ballot, whether that's legislature or especially things like a city council or a community college board or your NRD board, it's even less, uh, you know, do, do you think there's some steps we can take to uh, increase that, um, you know, that, I think it's just basic citizenship, I think, but to increase that engagement. That is correct. And actually, I've lived at other places in the country, flying for Delta Airlines and uh, living in the Air Force, I live at different places, and I've always voted. But what I've found is when I do vote, I before I go in to vote, I look at a sample ballot and I look at all the names. And a lot of people, I don't have a clue who they are or what they stand for. And I try to research them on the internet, and a lot of times there's nothing to be found anywhere. So the one thing that I did before launching into this campaign is I came back here and I said, I want a good website, and it's laurenlippincott.com. Uh -huh. And in that, I've got a two-minute, two-and-a-half-minute video you can watch. And we spent no expense in having a professional two-minute video done, so I would hope people would uh, look at that. Sure. But then also have listed what, where I stand on different uh, events because I want people to go to the polls educated. Um, in terms of fiscal policy, the way the legislature works, they set a budget every two years. Sometimes they have to make adjustments in between. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about what are legislative priorities, what should we be funding, how should we be making these decisions, um, how much money should we have in our rainy day fund. Generally, I think there's pretty good agreement that Nebraska, as compared to a lot of states, is pretty fiscally conservative and that uh, we manage our dollars. Um, but your, your thoughts, though, just generally on, on some of those dollars and cents type issues. Yep. Well, we just talked about education a few moments ago. And it's very interesting. There was a lot of these things that I was just shocked when I started researching doing this, this job here. 
And 38% of the Nebraska budget goes for education. $2.8 billion goes to the University of Nebraska. And that includes $600 million of your state taxes and $600 million of your federal taxes go to the University of Nebraska. Yeah. That's a lot. Right. And the question is, what do we get for it? And um, I've mentioned government-run schools. Well, it is a government-run school. And what you find is government always wants more. Enough is never enough. For instance, with education, you cannot find statistics that would support the idea that spending more money equates to a better product at the end, a better student, a student who's prepared. You can't find it. Also, you find regarding social programs, every $1 that you send to either Lincoln or to Washington, D.C. for social programs, welfare, for instance, $1 goes to Lincoln, only 30 cents comes back to where it's needed. That's true in Lincoln, true in Washington, D.C. It's not a very effective, efficient program. Hmm. Um, it, it, another big expenditure for the state, then, is um, are those social programs, health and human services, yep. is, is a big chunk of, of the budget. <laughs> There's been questions over the years about some oversight and some various things there. Well, generally, what's your philosophy on how we ought to be running some of those programs? It's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> People talk about, well, we need to help people that are poor, for instance. It's true, we do. Um, now, this, this, is, this is interesting. This kind of shocked me when I discovered this. There are 500 verses in the Bible that talk about prayer. There's 500 verses in the Bible that talk about faith. Those are important. There's 2,300 verses that talk about money. Well, that just proves we need to help poor people. True. But out of those 2,300 verses, only 200 talk about helping the poor. Just proves the point. Nope. Actually, there are only three verses that talk about the government helping the poor, and all three of those verses are regarding the government needs to ensure that there is justice in the courts when the poor go to court. All three. So uh, can we base theology, though, based on a, a number account of the Bible? I'm not sure that my pastor <laughs> would, uh, would, would agree with you there. Well, so if only three talks about the government helping the poor, the other verses are talking about our neighbors, the churches, our relatives, our families. So government is not very efficient. Government is a consumer, not a producer. And also, this is very interesting. There was an international study done on when governments supply more money for uh, its social programs, directly inverse of that is people being involved in churches. Government gets more involved with social programs. Church attendance goes down, directly related to one another. Oh, interesting. Um, Let's see, we talked about education, we talked about some of the social programs, uh, we talked about budget issues. Um, ju just in terms of agriculture, that's a large industry, especially in Nance, H Hamilton, uh, Merrick, and then the parts of Hall County. What do, we, what do we need to be doing in terms of agricultural policy to advance this state? Well, what you say is true. Uh, here uh, in Nebraska, 92% of our, our state is um, agriculture uh, in terms of land uh, mass. 97% is privately owned, 92% is agriculture. And in terms of our, agri uh, our economics, uh, is 23% is um, directly related to agriculture and 25% are actually employed th to, through uh, programs or yeah. jobs, uh, businesses that are uh, agriculture related. So it's very important that we cater to, listen to, and uh, address issues of agriculture. Here, here's the bottom line, what I think government has to do regarding um, agriculture and just businesses in general. We need to promote productivity. We do not need to penalize productivity. And that's true in taxation, it's true in programs, anything. So we need to be very business and agricultural oriented. 
Um, should the voters uh, send you to Lincoln to serve at the Capitol? Do you have any particular committees you would like to serve on? Well, yeah, and one, one thing I want to also add, you, you talked about voters. And one thing I think is very, very important, and that is voter integrity. What's happening with voter ID, for instance, that is there's a petition right now to get that on the ballot and from Senator Julie Slama, and I believe that that's very important. It's interesting to note that Nebraska does not currently have voter ID. They need to. 35 states have voter ID. Nebraska doesn't. Canada has it. We don't. Mexico has it. We don't. As a matter of fact, Mexico is having problems with voter uh, integrity in their system, and they decided we're going to go ahead and do voter ID with a photograph and thumbprint. And when they did that, their turnout was not 59 percent, it jumped up to 68 percent. It increased nine percentage points. Why? Because people had confidence in the integrity of their voting system. In Europe, for instance, 46 countries have voter ID and it will soon be 47. Great Britain currently has legislation pending in Parliament that will include them also to have voter ID. We don't. We need to have voter ID. Very interesting. Um, committees. I, I think I was asking about committee assignments. Are there any particular uh, you know, areas of interest that, that you would like to focus on? I mean, I know when you're there, you have to vote on every bill, but each, each senator is allowed to serve on committees, or maybe they're able to kind of funnel some of their interests. Yep. Uh, currently, there's 49 state senators. We all know that. Yeah. I know about 20 of them, and they know me, so I will ask them, they, they know my weaknesses, my strengths, and they'll put me where they want. That's normally what they do with freshmen anyway. Right, right. But uh, my, the current state senator for the 34th district is Kurt Friesen. He's on the uh, communication. Telecommunications uh, and Telecommunication, that is yep. correct. And I think that the work that he has done, I would hope that I can stand on his shoulders and continue doing that as well. Of course, everybody likes to uh, you know, the power associated with the revenue yep. uh, and the appropriations committee. Those two committees are very important. The Judiciary Committee, I think, is very, very important in terms of uh, different laws that we have, laws that we currently have and need to have, uh, very important. So there's a lot of different things in Lincoln that could be, uh, I think, that I, c I could serve. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of in this term limits era now. We have been for a while um, where it seems to be a senator these days. Senators used to maybe kind of uh, ease into it a little bit, but you almost kind of have to hit the ground running. Have you been doing your homework in anticipation that should you uh, be elected that uh, you're going to be prepared to, to get to work in Lincoln? I have. Um, I've tried to spend every day, I've tried to spend time just learning about things. And, you know, in, in the Air Force, I flew different airplanes, Delta Airlines flew different airplanes, and it takes a while to get up to speed on different things. But I think that when you look at a candidate, you need to look at several different things. You need to ask yourself, are they capable? That is, are they able to learn a job and do it quickly, have a steep learning curve? So are they capable and are they willing to do the job? Are they honest? Do they fear God? And also, um, are they trustworthy? Are they a person of their word? A lot of the senators that I've talked to over and over and over again, I've heard this uh, from several of them, and they say, make sure you know who you can trust. Because a lot of times people, they, they commit, I'll vote this particular way on a bill, and then when it comes time to voting, they switch. They change their minds. Also, I hear from a lot of senators that say you have to be a listener. You have to be able to go in sometimes, and, and maybe there are people in your district to disagree with you on something, but they feel pretty strongly about it. Uh, I, you know, how do you uh, maybe approach that, being able to, to listen and being open to, to different pr perspectives? <laughs> well, <laughs> the one thing that I'm discovering in this whole thing is how much I do not know. So it's very, very important to find people that you trust, people that align with your beliefs, get plugged into them and uh, have them help you along to learn different things. Um, for instance, you're talking about all these different subjects. Another one that I'm very interested in is Second Amendment. Well, we can all say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm for the Second Amendment. Sure. Well, there's more to it than that. And so you have to learn about the particulars of a particular subject that's facing the voters in this state and the state legislature. For instance, with a uh, the Second Amendment. 
Currently, Nebraska is an open carry state, which means any of us can put our six shooter on our hip just like Matt Dillon and Gunsmoke. But if you take the gun out of your holster and put it in your coat, now it's a concealed weapon. Right. And now you need a day of training and $200. You need a pink slip from the government, which says, mother, may I? Yes, you may. And um, unfortunately, they tried to get constitutional carry with Senator Tom Brewer passed, and it uh, did not pass by two votes. That's unfortunate. But so I am for constitutional carry. That's one part of the Second Amendment that I am for. The other one is Nebraska is currently a uh, state which has what's called the castle doctrine. Right. Your home is your castle. That's right. where it gets its name. And which means if somebody is using lethal force against you in your home, you can defend yourself. Castle, and you also have the duty to retreat as part of the Nebraska law. Well, that's good, but what's better is stand your ground legislation which means wherever you are, here in the mall, the Conestoga Mall in Grand Island, your public library, you're at the drive-in, you're at the movie theater, and if you're met with lethal force, you can defend yourself, and that's called stand your ground. So Castle Doctrine, good. Stand your ground, better, and we need to have that. Open carry, good, and constitutional carry, better. So your question was, are you able to listen? And I hope that I am and also to learn and willing to learn, because a lot of things are not as simple as we thought. I mentioned that I was a page in the legislature, and I remember sitting up beside the speaker and running the microphones when I was a college kid, and I'd listen to the proponents of some particular legislation. And I would think, easy, this is gonna sail right through. But then the opponents, the people against the legislation, they'd st stand up and voice their concerns, and I'd think to myself, hmm, not as simple as I thought. Always two sides to different subjects. It's called critical thinking skills. Better. Uh, one thing we haven't touched about uh, is economic development, growing jobs, and then related issues. Uh, you know, the, the, the workforce issues, the housing issues, your thoughts to how we can address some of those things, which I hear from folks, especially in the Aurora and Central City area, all the time about workforce, they can't find workforce, and then when they do, they can't find housing. Well, unfortunately, the government has made it profitable to not work. Um, that's been true with the pandemic, the, the China virus, and um, we need to eliminate that. That's over, it's done, we need to press ahead and go, go forward. And like I said, we need to promote productivity, not penalize productivity. That's just a broad brush overview on social and economic different uh, factors that, are, that, that face us here in, in Grand Island and Aurora, Central City. So government needs to be user-friendly to private enterprise. Are there particular strategies, though, the government can do to, to help with some of the workforce and the housing issues? Right now, um, we have uh, we've got income tax, we've got property tax, we've got taxes on almost everything. Now, some people talk about um, the, a, having a consumption tax, uh, the EPIC consumption tax. Right, and and right. EPIC is a, an acronym, Eliminate Property, Income, Corporate Tax, and Inheritance Tax, and Sales Tax, and replace that with a consumption tax. <clears throat> now, the consumption tax would tax only new products. So if I want to buy your used car, there's no tax. Um, anything that's used, there's no tax. Now I have just an average income right now, a pension from airlines, and, and my income is pretty much national average. And I went to their website to see if I'd pay more or less with the consumption tax. I'd save $7,000 a year on taxes. That's quite a bit. So your question, and I, I know I'm being broad here in yeah. answering it, but we need to look at all different types of options with a microscope and see what helps. And a lot of times, you know, the status quo is what we currently have, obviously, by definition. Right. And so we need to look and, and see, are there better ways of doing it? Because we do want to be business and individual friendly. Sure, 
Sure. Yeah, I'm just thinking I hear from a lot of employers who, who would like to be able to expand, um, but, but they, they, it's a challenge finding, finding workforce. And I didn't know if they're, you know, I know uh, in Grand Island in particular, they're working with Wayne State and trying to, you know, bring interns here. If there, if there are programs like that or other initiatives you can think of that you support that, that would help the, the communities in your district. <laughs> One thing I failed to mention is I'm, I'm also a small business owner. I've got two boys. They're grown up and um, 37 and 39 years old. The youngest one, 37 year old, he lives down in Jefferson City, Missouri, and we've got a Planet Fitness Gymnasium franchise. Oh, okay. So with that gym, we've got approximately 12 people that we sure. employ at any one time, and they're normally young, 20, sure. 22 year old people. And uh, so there's a lot of things that a person can look at um, Regarding our schools, our education, help kids get prepared for the workforce. Um, a lot of folks don't even know how to fill out a job application or how to do it correctly. First thing that we do when looking at somebody to hire is that we look at their social, uh, their, you know, Facebook and these types of things that they have and just look at the uh, footprint of those things to see if they're troublemakers or if they're hardworking, dedicated. Very good. Just checking my camera here. Give me just That's a okay. second. Make sure that we're good. Amazing. It's shocking. All right. Well, as, as we conclude, any, any other final comments uh, as the voters, uh, you know, study their ballots? Uh, anything you would like them to keep in mind? Well, I've wanted to, I, I actually have wanted to do this ever since I was a page in the legislature back when I was in college. Uh, I think it's an opportunity to serve the state, serve your local community, and in essence, serve our nation. So I've had a lot of training in the military, courtesy of the United States government and your tax money. And this is an opportunity for me to give back. I know it doesn't pay a lot, it's $1,000 a month. Um, I've always lived well below my means, so I can carry the load regarding that. But it's something that I, really desire to do. I hope that I'm capable of doing it. And I hope that I ha have a humble listening attitude to learn from other people that uh, I respect and, and hopefully can represent people well here in our, our uh, heart of Nebraska. Very good. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> okay.